Welcome back to the Common Sense Skeptics Teardown of the Solar City Bailout Trial against Elon Musk in the Delaware Court of Chancery, Class Action 12711 VCS, with transcripts provided by Plainsight.org. We're picking things up after the lunch break on the first day of testimony where Randall Barron of the plaintiff's legal team still has Elon Musk, the first witness of the proceedings, in the hot seat. To recap the two earlier segments from the day, the trial opened with the direct examination of Elon Musk by an attorney from his defense team named Evan Chesler, who pretty much let Musk commit perjury on the stand by allowing him to give the court his own twisted version of his autobiography. That song and dance lasted for about 35 pages. The cross-examination of Musk started on page 44, where Randall Barron of the plaintiff side of this class action started dissecting many of the lies Musk had already told from the stand, and that got Musk's back up. Part 2 continued with this cross-examination of Musk by Barron, where Musk pretty much exposed himself as being a 50-year-old spoiled man-child who does what he wants, when he wants, including berating opposing counsel from the witness box, as if he had any right to attack an officer of this court when he is the one on trial. And in a Delaware court of chancery, that's never a good idea. Now in Part 3, Barron is going to pick up where he left off before the break, asking Musk about the dire financial straits Solar City was in at the time of the bailout. This segment is where Barron gets set to hammer Musk on the numbers of this deal and test Musk's actual awareness about the solar company he was chairman of the board for, as per Musk's demand from when he provided Lyndon and Peter Rive with millions of dollars to get Solar City started. And being honest, Barron is going to demonstrate that Musk has no business being at the helm of any company, of any size, public or private, and you're going to see why by the end of this episode. Just before the break, Barron asked Musk several times, as he had done repeatedly during Musk's deposition in 2019, for any documents Musk could provide that indicated Solar City had been given a green light to raise funds through a secondary stock offering. Musk could not provide them then, and he couldn't provide them now. So now Barron turns to a different money raising alternative pursued by Musk and Solar City. This one's called a pipe, or private investment in public equity. A pipe is defined on Investopedia as the buying of shares of publicly traded stock at a price below the current market value. This buying method is a practice of investment firms, mutual funds, and other large accredited investors. A traditional pipe is one in which common or preferred stock is issued at a set price to the investor, while a structured pipe issues common or preferred shares of convertible debt. Barron asked Musk several times about Solar City's pursuit of a pipe arrangement with outside institutions, but instead of answering Barron's questions, Musk starts repeating a statement he started making before the break, which does not answer Barron's question. Musk, without being asked, states that companies engaged in acquisition discussions cannot go out and issue equity, and that instead they required a bridge loan to get by. Barron tries several times to get a yes-no response to this simple question regarding a pipe arrangement or selling bonds, but Musk keeps deflecting with this nonsense response. Musk once again starts giving monologues instead of answers, and a number of times when Musk stops to take a breath, Barron has to get Musk to focus on the questions being asked. We lost count of the number of times Barron had to say to him, that's not my question, Mr. Musk. The question was very direct. Mr. Musk, I just asked a simple question. And it doesn't take very long at all for Barron to start tripping Musk up by using standard investment industry speak with him. For example, within minutes of starting this session, Musk was confused about what Barron even meant by a pipe, going so far as to ask Barron on page 139, by pipe, are you referring to Tesla providing money? What are you referring to? When Barron asked Musk if he knew what a pipe was, Musk seemed to know what the letters stood for, but not exactly what the term meant. At the top of page 140, Barron clarifies with Musk that Solar City's banker, Lazard, looked into getting a pipe arrangement set up for Solar City, which Musk agrees with, but they found that avenue was not actionable, and they could not find anyone willing to invest in the company through a pipe. But Musk didn't believe that assessment. Barron informs Musk, based on the evidence, that Lazard, quote, went and talked to a number of private equity folks about entering into a pipe with Solar City, and they all said no. But when Musk was asked if that was correct, Musk denies it saying the issue wasn't the company, it was the time frame they needed it done in. Regardless of the reasons, at the end of the day, no pipe arrangements were created as a result of Lazard's efforts to provide funds for Solar City. Again, Musk deflects to talk about bridge loans. By the bottom of page 141, Vice Chancellor Slites again steps in, as he had done before lunch, to tell Musk to answer Barron's question. Now, his simple answer for Barron was no, but it was two pages after the question was originally asked. Then, once again, Musk starts monologuing about bridge loans, specifically his request for the Tesla board to provide a bridge loan to Solar City to keep their lights on. And now it becomes clear why Musk is pushing this narrative. It's because the board originally told him no, 
He's trying to demonstrate the board of Tesla could stand up to him, if what he's saying is in fact true. And if Musk had let this matter die after that response from them and accepted that response, it might actually have had some significance. But of course he didn't, so it doesn't. At the top of page 143, Barron reminds Musk about two attempts SolarCity made to access the public equity markets to raise funds, and they were told by two banks that it could not be done. Musk might not recall this, but Barron has exhibit JX527 to back up his question. It's the Solar City board presentation from October of 2015 that Musk can't recall if he attended as chairman of the board, where Goldman Sachs had approached two different investment banks on Solar City's behalf, and neither of them recommended an equity raise at that time. This was in 2015, before the installation numbers started declining, but a quick look at the revenue versus profit graph already shows that the company was losing money hand over fist. And that's why Goldman Sachs reported that getting one done would be, quote unquote, extremely tough. Meaning it wasn't impossible, but in order to get it done, they were looking at having to drop the share price by 7-12%, to and at the current share price of SolarCity, that would have been extremely value destructive, shaving $444 million off of the market cap of the company. Musk disagreed with his own financial experts because, well, he's Musk, and he's got a diploma or something in economics from somewhere, so he knows better than anybody, right? Time to test that theory. Barron starts quizzing Musk on what he knew about the financial condition of the company, starting with Exhibit JX484, an email dated September 29, 2015 from Radford Small at SolarCity to Brian Ellis and CC to Brad Buss, who is CFO at SolarCity and a director on the board of Tesla. This email reiterates a warning given to Buss and Tangai Sarah on the previous day that their direct cash forecast showed SolarCity corporate cash would drop to $35 million during the week of November 20th. And that's a problem, because SolarCity had loans in which there were covenants that required the company to keep that cash balance above $115 million. Exhibit JX491 continues that email chain dated September 30th, 2015. It reads as follows. We started the year with $642 million of cash. We drew $160 on the revolver, SpaceX gave us $165, and the power company will generate $120. So $1.1 billion total war chest to start. We end with plus or minus 200, which means we are down $900 million. The question is asked if Musk was aware of this, and the response was another irrelevant monologue that ended with, that sounds like a good deal to me. Further up in the email it reads, Tangai was visibly distraught over this. He is beyond frustrated with Brad and his incompetence. He is convinced that we have a major liquidity crisis and need to convert right away, which will force sizable dilution. But Musk doesn't think this in any way has anything to do with the health of the business, as he states on page 152. Page 153, another email chain marked Exhibit JX503, including Peter Rive, the CTO, Lyndon Rive, the CEO, Tangai Sarah, and Brad Buss, which was going to institute weekly cash meetings to monitor this situation. Meetings that Musk says he was unaware of as chairman, and he doesn't recall attending any of them. Another email on page 155, this one from Brian Ellis to Lyndon Rive and Brad Buss, indicating a cash balance at the end of the year of approximately $91 million, which was $24 million below the revolver threshold covenant. This could trigger defaults and cross defaults, which Musk claims, as chairman of the board, he didn't recall, but he didn't think of it as a game changer, since $100 million is a lot of money, according to him. And it is, but it's not enough money when considering the revolver loan covenants in place. Musk goes so far as to tell Barron just because creditors can take action doesn't mean they will. Which means Musk was counting on his creditors to not live up to their own contracts that protect those people whose money they had handed over to Musk. Exhibit JX738, minutes from the board of directors meeting for Solar City, dated February 2nd, 2016, which Musk doesn't know if he attended. Again. At this meeting, the company was forecasting negative cash flow for the entire year of 2016, conservatively expecting the company to lose another $200 million that they already did not have in reserve. Musk says several times he expected this, because the company was in a quote-unquote high growth mode. This is information he did not bother to pass along to Robin Denholm, that the Solar City board was forecasting losing a quarter billion dollars in the next 12 months. And as for Musk's claim the company was in a strong growth mode, there is absolutely no chart to back up that belief. Same exhibit on page 12, Barron shows Musk some charts that we don't have, which were predictions of the company's liquidity by month for 2016, which was going to be below thresholds for May, August, and September especially, where the company was again in danger of triggering defaults and other cross-defaults and other recourse loans. 
And again, Musk was counting on the creditors protecting him instead of their investors by not requiring immediate repayment for failing to live up to the conditions of their deal. Page 162, Exhibit JX759, it's an updated chart from Brian Ellis produced specifically for Musk because he was attending the next cash planning meeting, which Musk already said he couldn't recall attending. Exhibit JX777 confirms Musk was at that meeting, whose sole purpose was to discuss the fact that there were legitimate concerns about cash planning and potentially breaching covenants. This was more information that never made it to the shareholders through public disclosure. This meeting covered topics beyond the need to raise money. It also covered inventory management, capex spending, and pushing out vendor payments to keep their numbers as high as possible on paper. Generally speaking, as soon as you start putting off paying your vendor and contractor bills, it's only a matter of time before everyone comes calling. Musk's response to this was still stuck in a loop where the company was growing quickly and needed to raise money to keep the growth going. But Lyndon Rive is already on the record through his deposition that pushing out vendor payments because they couldn't pay their bills was a huge concern. And at this point, Musk so much as calls his cousin a liar about this on page 165. Barron asks Musk directly if this was inaccurate testimony from Rive, and Musk replies, I suppose it would be. Exhibit JX816 starts off a new line of questioning. This one focused specifically on the sales department's inability to make sufficient sales to meet guidance on megawatts deployed. Specifically, the passage referring to being concerned the quality of our opportunities will deteriorate. It's a fancy way of identifying a declining interest in their products. A fourth paragraph reading, performance marketing has missed their forecast, and the answer is demand is way down. Which is consistent with the graph labeled PDX1, which looks something like this. Sales were on the decline moving into early 2016 and continued to sink because demand was way down, which was about to create additional problems because hundreds of millions of dollars worth of solar bonds sold in 2015 were now coming due. And the biggest holder of those bonds was SpaceX. Unable to get a pipe deal done, Musk and the Rye brothers created $124 million in bonds to raise the money they needed for Solar City, then buying the lion's share of those bonds between them. So this was, in effect, a bridge loan that officers of the company were providing to keep the lights on, while guaranteeing themselves a 6.5% annual rate of return on bonds redeemable after the bailout was supposed to take place at a time when the prime rate was only 3.5%. In order to buy these bonds, Musk had to take out personal lines of credit using Tesla shares as collateral on the $65 million worth of solar bonds he bought. The Rye brothers each bought another $17.5 million each, so between the three men, they bought $100 million of the $124 million worth of bonds on offer. And SpaceX would also be a major factor in these bonds, acquiring a total of $255 million worth of these bonds over several offerings, the first of which were now coming due. At the top of page 168, Barron brings up the fact that SpaceX, another company with Musk at the helm, held millions of dollars worth of Solar City bonds that were coming due in early 2016. These were bought a year prior, $90 million worth in March of 2015 and $75 million more in June of 2015, shortly after SpaceX received a boatload of money from NASA to produce Crew Dragon. However, Solar City was in no position to pay these bonds out. They had no money, and they would have needed to take out more debt to pay out that debt. So Musk, without asking the board at SpaceX for approval on this measure, rolled those bonds over for another term, charging Solar City an even higher rate of return. Not paying out these bonds prevented breaching the covenants on loans that required Solar City to keep their cash reserves at a particular level. And it made SpaceX the single largest holder of Solar City bonds. These bonds, as Barron notes, were sold as solar bonds, but they had nothing to do with solar energy. Here's the ad they ran, selling the bonds as if they were going to be paid out of pure sunshine. And start getting paid by the sun. These were subordinate corporate debt, nothing more. But as it turns out, buying these bonds in 2015 was definitively against SpaceX corporate policy. That is to say, unless an exception was granted through a unanimous vote of the SpaceX board of directors. SpaceX did not invest in any other companies in this fashion or at all. However, they invested a quarter billion dollars in Solar City because, as Musk states on page 171, I had faith in the future of Solar City. He made that decision, not the board. Musk did, unilaterally and without permission, against SpaceX corporate policy. It was concerning enough to Brett Johnson, general counsel at SpaceX, that he wrote an email labeled Exhibit JX325 to Brad Buss, who was the CFO at Solar City at the time and the director at Tesla, telling Buss buying those bonds would violate the policy. This purchase was also a tremendous financial risk in that, as Barron points out on page 172, 
this recourse debt would have been paid out absolutely last if Solar City went under. Every other creditor of Solar City would have been paid out before these bonds. Musk dismissed that risk by again falsely stating Solar City could raise money in the markets as a publicly traded company. This is a dead horse, but Musk keeps beating it instead of answering Barron's question, which has to be asked several more times before Musk admits on page 174 that he did not understand this was the case, that these bonds were subordinate corporate debt. Barron again calls up Exhibit JX325, wherein Brett Johnson tells Musk specifically that this purchase was against company policy and he needed to send out a notice to each director for their consent because he needed unanimous consent to proceed and he needed Musk's approval to send out that notice. So let's be clear about the job of a general counsel of a company. Their job is to follow the company's constitution, charter, and guidelines and protect the company from legal ramifications arising from the course of business. It is not to kowtow to the chairman of the board and do his bidding. Johnson recognized that Musk's intentions were a violation of company policy that required a unanimous vote of the board to remedy. His job is to send out that notice with or without Musk's approval so that the board is aware of what's going on without their knowledge and behind their back. Page 175, line 12, Barron brings up page 9 of the SpaceX charter, which outlines the eight eligible investments the company might consider, of which subordinated corporate debt was not one. As it turns out, Musk claims to have written these guidelines himself way back in the days of Zip2 and that the documents have followed with him ever since. We say claims because Musk was never chairman, CEO, or CFO at Zip2. He was the CTO, and a piss poor one at that. So it would have been very unusual for someone in that position to be writing company policy at the ripe old age of 25 when his board consisted of very senior executives with decades of experience in corporate governance. Further, Musk claims that these are the same documents used as PayPal corporate documents, but Musk did not found PayPal, and he never worked for a company called PayPal, we've gone through this before, although he likes to tell people those lies on a regular basis. According to Musk, apparently, these same documents were at the time all shared also by SpaceX, SolarCity, and Tesla. Assuming Musk had any involvement in the writing of these documents he claims to have created all by himself, he, better than anyone, should have known he was breaking the company rules. And that did not stop him. On April 26, 2016, Musk sent out a board of directors package for the next SpaceX board meeting. This was after Musk's emergency meeting at Tesla, where he pitched the idea of Tesla buying SolarCity on March 15th. The board's instruction at that time was to stand down on the SolarCity acquisition, as they had also said previously on February 29th at a previous meeting. But Musk says he can't recall those outcomes from those meetings at the bottom of page 176. We're going to step away from SpaceX for just a little bit to get caught up at the other companies caught in this pyramid, since Musk is again without being asked, telling the court that SolarCity either needed to raise funds or get acquired, and this is at the top of page 177. But all Barron wants to do here is establish a timeline, trying to confirm that the April 26 meeting at SpaceX was after the Tesla meetings where he was told to stand down on pursuing SolarCity. It was also after a board meeting at Solar City in April, which Musk can't recall if he attended, doesn't recall if he saw the presentation materials, and has to rely on the minutes of the meeting to confirm if he was even there as chairperson of the board. Turns out he was, but it's not surprising Musk can't remember being there because the agenda centered around the fact that Solar City intramonth lows were going to be below the liquidity covenants in April, May, June, July, August, September, and at least October of 2016. Meaning Musk knew at that time SolarCity was at risk of having creditors trigger repayment of debt that they could not afford to repay. Barron asked Musk if this information was publicly available, but Musk didn't know. Barron asked Musk if Robin Denholm, who was supposedly in charge of negotiating the deal on Tesla's behalf, was made aware of this information. She was not. Barron asked Musk if he ever told her directly, and Musk deflected the question five times without confirming he had told Denholm about these financial issues at Solar City, so Barron confirms it for him on page 181. In the same meeting minutes, starting on page 22, the discussion turns to the sales side of Solar City and how sales are declining enough that the previous guidance of 1,250 megawatts for the year will have to be reduced by 28% to 900 megawatts. From the Investopedia definition of guidance, guidance is a company's own best estimates to shareholders of its upcoming earnings. And the fourth point here, companies pair their guidance reports with disclosure statements maintaining that their projections are by no means guaranteed in order to shield themselves from potential lawsuits. So not only was SolarCity already flailing financially, they were expecting to lose 28% of their expected sales volume through to the end of the year. This meeting was in April of 2016. 
Barron brings up the graph showing the steady decline of Solar City installations through 2016, and it turned out that even the 28% drop was not deep enough. Actual numbers for fiscal 2016 were only 846 megawatts, a 32% drop. When asked by Barron if that guidance had been made public knowledge, Musk again didn't know. And again, he didn't know if Robin Denholm knew this information going into acquisition negotiations. On page 184, Musk finally tells the court he did not share this information with her regarding this change in guidance. In fact, in May 2016, when SolarCity announced its revised guidance to the shareholders, the company lied outright, saying the drop was only going to be between 1,000 and 1,100 megawatts instead of down to the estimated 900, which turned out to be only 846. Next up is Exhibit 1143, an email dated June 2, 2016, indicating that SolarCity, quote, Concerns of cash management are so great that they are now looking at ways to hold back accounts payable in order to slide somewhere above that liquidity covenant." End quote. There's even a Plan A and a Plan B. Plan A is to not pay their contracts $13 million that they owe them. Plan B is to pay some of their debts but only keep $2 million above the debt covenant. Both options here screw over the contractors relying on the company to pay their bills so they can feed their families. Barron asks Musk if Lyndon Rive, the CEO of the company, had told Musk, the chairman of the board, that the company was withholding accounts payable to save their own ass. And Musk couldn't recall that conversation. He didn't know if that information was made available to the shareholders and the general public. And Denholm didn't know Solar City was withholding accounts payable because he never told her that either. And on top of all of this, another round of solar bonds were coming due in June, of which SpaceX held $75 million worth. So Musk, again without approval from the SpaceX board, rolled those bonds over at a higher rate of interest against corporate policy because Musk believed it was a good investment, despite knowing the financial troubles the company was in, a company he had already pitched to Tesla at least twice in February and again in March to have taken over. Exhibit JX1387 is called up, an email dated June 30th, 2016 from Tangai Sarah. Sarah was appointed COO of SolarCity in 2013 and was promoted to president of the company in November of 2015, right before the sales started falling off the cliff. Apparently, the experience he brought from Vivant Solar as CEO was not going to be enough to save SolarCity. The quote in the email from Sarah on page 191 reads, Sales is presently broke. Every report is drenched in a sea of red. It all starts with opportunity creation and guess the trend. And Musk, the visionary genius chairperson, the face of Solar City at every photo op, claims to know nothing about this, and he's not even sure how a sales department can be broke. So when Barron asks Musk if he told Denholm about this sea of red ink at Solar City and the sales department being broke, of course we already know the answer. He told her nothing about it, and had no idea what she knew about this situation. Now we're moving into July of 2016. Tesla has now made an offer for Solar City. Solar City set up a special committee headed by Nancy Fund at Solar City, who as we noted before was partners with Ira Aaronpries, who was a director on the board at Tesla, and they hired Lazard as an advisor to the deal. According to Exhibit JX1452, Lazard didn't start learning about the liquidity problem at Solar City until July of 2016, and they quickly issued an update that indicated Solar City was going to be below the liquidity covenant straight through until at least the end of October. And in response, Musk states three more times without being asked that Solar City needed to raise money or get acquired, before Barron confirms Musk never told the board of Tesla any of this crucial information. Exhibit JX1453 is the recorded minutes of a special committee meeting of July 9th, 2016, wherein Mr. Mir of Lazard informed the committee that Solar City was close to breaching liquidity covenants and would have very little margin of error until October. Sarah agreed with that assessment. Again, Musk repeats the nonsense about raising funds or getting acquired when asked if he told the board at Tesla anything about this analysis. Now it's the Solar City Board of Directors meeting of July 21st that Musk didn't bother attending. Minutes are Exhibit JX1632. Mr. Mir advised the committee to, quote, consider the value of Tesla's proposal not just in terms of a premium to the current trading price of the company's shares, if any, but also in the terms of offering a solution to avoid the downside liquidity scenario, end quote. This is Lazard telling the board they're screwed and they need to take the deal. And Mr. Bilicek of Lazard noted they should move on this promptly, as noted on the top of page 197. When questioned about this, Musk's response was the same as before, his pre-recorded loop. Solar City needed to raise money or get acquired. 
Baron questions whether or not Musk disagreed with Lazard's advice to take the deal to save their behinds, and of course, Musk disagrees with it, because he's living in La La Land where he still thinks Solar City can raise money as a publicly traded company whenever it wants to. So to bring Musk back down to Earth, Baron calls up Exhibit JX1719, a presentation of the special committee from July 29th. They had made an effort to shop Solar City to any other interested party and there was not one single party interested except, of course, for Tesla. Solar City had no other buyers if this deal fell through, and unsurprisingly, Musk was unaware of this. On the very next page was a list of parties who were approached by the committee as potential pipe investors. Absolutely no one was interested. So every time Musk stated in this segment of testimony that Solar City could raise funds at will, he was lying to Barron, lying to the court, and apparently he was lying to himself. And still, Musk at this time tells the court that Solar City, as a publicly traded company, could raise this money in the equity market anytime they wanted to, despite having absolutely no one else back him up on that claim and no one giving the company the green light for such an offering. So now, Musk is going to throw Lyndon Rive, his own cousin, into oncoming traffic by suggesting Lyndon told him the reason everybody passed on the pipe offer was because of the time frame they needed it done in, not because the company was an obvious financial disaster. Lyndon will have to cover Musk's ass when it's his turn on the stand, except we already know from Lyndon's deposition that he personally told Musk way back in 2015 they needed $300 million to keep the lights on. Then at the bottom of page 200, Barron accidentally tests Musk's knowledge of the financial world and its terminology by asking Musk if he understood Solar City was on the brink of a liquidity event, something they've been talking about for this entire segment. Musk says, on the brink of needing to raise money? Yes. Barron corrects him on the definition in this context. On the brink of a liquidity event where debt covenants are going to be breached, triggering defaults and cross defaults, creating a very serious financial problem for the company. To which Musk replies, I think you are misunderstanding. A liquidity event is a fundraising. No, it's bloody well not. And judging from the transcript, that answer left Barron a little gobsmacked. It's too bad Slights gave the two minute warning for the next break right then, which made Barron pivot in his questioning. Barron brings up Exhibit JX3171, an internal email from a vendor with the header Urgent Still No Payment on a bill for $373,000 that Solar City wasn't paying. As Barron states, Solar City had a market cap of over $2 billion, which looks like this as a number, and was withholding payment from one of their own vendors for $373,000, which looks like this as a number. This company Musk had complete faith in, who saw no financial instability whatsoever, who invested a quarter billion dollars of NASA's money into it through SpaceX, could not make good on paying their vendor an amount equal to 0.01865% of their market cap. And according to Musk, this was all part of the company's general cash plan to delay payments to preserve cash, officially screwing over the little guys to keep their own heads above water on paper. And that's a great spot for Barron to halt questioning before the afternoon 3 p.m. recess. But before we join them on break, we want to recap Musk's performance during this segment, because this really shows his ineptitude defending his position on the stand. He was like a puppet with a pull string, and we're going to show you the truth of it. We're going to show you how often Musk repeated the same line by showing you the phrase, and then flashing up the page and line number from each time he used it during this episode's segment of testimony. The number of times he didn't know if he was at important key meetings while he was chairman of that particular company. The number of times he told the court that Solar City could access the equity markets anytime they wanted to, despite having no evidence from banking or finance experts backing up that claim. The number of times he didn't recall conversations with key executives about various financial shortfalls at Solar City. The number of times he didn't know if he received agendas or minutes of those meetings, or was present for presentations when he was chairperson of that company, or was unaware of the contents of particular documents. The number of times he didn't know what he told Robin Denholm or what she knew about the financial health of the company. The number of times he didn't know what information was being made available to the public or to his shareholders. The number of times he didn't recall financial advisors telling him that the company couldn't find any takers on providing a pipe arrangement. The number of times he didn't recall the company being in breach of debt covenants facing potential liquidity issues. The number of times he told Barron Solar City had to raise funds or get acquired. And on top of this, the number of times he mentions a company's inability to raise funds while undergoing acquisition negotiations with further reference to bridge loans. In other words, Musk did an amazing job at proving exactly how inept he is as chairman of a board. Any board, never mind one of a multi-billion dollar corporation. 
Remember at the top of the episode, we were going to demonstrate how Musk should not be allowed anywhere near any company of any size, public or private? Here comes that assessment. On SpriggsHR.com, they've got a concise page about what it takes to be chairperson of the company, and unsurprisingly, the ability to buy and demand the seat is not on their list. Here's what is. The primary role of a chairperson is to ensure that the board of directors is effective in its principal goal, which is to set and implement the company's direction and strategy. Usually, the chairperson is appointed by the board itself and can either be a full-time or part-time role, depending on the board's demands. Sometimes, usually in smaller companies, the role of the chairperson is combined with a managing director or chief executive. However, and this is kind of important, joint roles such as those are not recommended for public companies that are listed on any stock exchange. The essential chairperson responsibilities include acting as the organization's leading representative, taking the chair at both general meetings and board meetings, taking a leading role in determining the composition and structure of the board, and ensuring effective and constructive communication with shareholders and stakeholders. The key qualities of an effective chairperson, what ultimately defines whether a chairperson is strong, is their ability to manage an effective board as well as their management of the board's relationship with shareholders and stakeholders. Some defining qualities of a good chairperson include the ability to chair meetings. Well, Musk doesn't even know if he attended half of them. Understanding the business. Musk can't remember conversations he had with financial partners or CEO about key problems within the company or the cash problems that were resulting in liquidity issues. The ability to influence without dominating. Well, remember what Musk told 60 Minutes? Yeah, I mean, that's not realistic. I mean, Like a, a largest, babysitter. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not realistic in the sense that I am the largest shareholder in the company um, and I can just call for a shareholder vote and get anything done that I, that I want. Having an assertive personality while avoiding dominating discussions is essential. And finally, good communication. Well, Musk can't remember telling his own board or his own shareholders any particular information whatsoever. And when Musk was telling the public information directly, it was completely false and even fraudulent. Withholding actual guidance and presenting his fake solar roofing tiles are just two examples here. In summary, the essential chairperson responsibilities can be boiled down to the following. Providing leadership to the board. Musk fails. Taking responsibilities for the board's composition and development. Musk loaded up Tesla's board based on what they invested, not what they had experience in. Ensuring proper information for the board. Complete fail. Planning and conducting board meetings effectively. Musk not only didn't plan the meetings, he didn't attend half of them. Engaging all directors in the board's work. Well, that would be a complete fail because how are you going to do that if you don't attend half the meetings? Ensuring the board remains focused on its key tasks and responsibilities. Well, at the time of the bailout, Tesla should have been laser focused on getting their production lines from Model X and the launch from Model 3 sorted around, not dicking around with a bailout at Solar City. Getting all directors on board in the process of assessing and improving the board's performance. Again, how do you do that in absentia? And finally, overseeing the induction and development of new directors. But what has actually happened at Tesla, in the interim, is that they have cut the number of directors almost in half. When you take all this into account, the final paragraph on this page sums it up nicely. When inadequate leadership and governance is so closely linked to underperformance and even failure of boards and companies alike, the role of the chairperson is critical. It's no wonder Musk says he hates being the boss. He sucks at it. However, he doesn't seem to mind having all the perks of the job. And that is going to wrap up part three of this series as we go into the 3 p.m. recess. When the next segment is ready to go, you'll see the link to click right here. Thank <laughs> you.